Coming up, Kirk Herbstreet's got a dire warning for Tennessee. I have a warning of my own for Florida. And we get a couple of key updates from Tuscaloosa. It is all on the way next, right here on SEC Country Live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to SEC Country Live. My name is Brandon Adams. Happy to have you with us in our normal spot every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. We're getting close to the start of the upcoming season. we got a lot of news for you to cover here on today's program. Coming up in a little less than 20 minutes' time, we'll talk to Ryan Fowler. Ryan doing a terrific job covering the Alabama Crimson Tide. What happened with tight end Jaleel Billingsley missing some practice? What's going on with the injury status of LeBron Ray? Ryan will cover all of that with us here coming up in just a little bit. Also, coaches poll came out yesterday. We'll take a look at those top five teams in the coaches poll, including a couple in the SEC. Their chances to win the national championship from a gambling perspective. We'll talk to our buddy Betty uh, Barry Barger from BetUS about that coming up in just a little bit of time. Before that, though, it's time to go above the fold with the big news around the SEC, and obviously a lot of the attention around the league here this time of year being paid to some of the first year coaches and how they are doing everything they possibly can to get their programs up and running with that in mind Kirk Herbstreit the most well-known voice in the sport the number one analyst on ESPN's college game day and the primetime game of the week was on the sports radio station in Knoxville this week known as the sports animal and the subject of exactly what awaits Josh Heupel in his first year at Tennessee comes up here and I felt like that Herb Street in the midst of this interview gave a little bit of a stark description of what the situation could be like in Knoxville if things don't go well for Tennessee early in the year. Let me let you hear Kirk Herb Street from the Sports Animal in Knoxville. It gives us a chance to talk some vols here. Take a listen to this here on SEC Country Live. Obviously, Tennessee, man, I, living in Nashville, it's been a, a challenging uh, time, you know, clearly for, for this program. And, you know, for the last, I don't know how many years, but especially this this turnover, new AD, new coach, a lot of players have left with the transfer portal. So you're essentially starting over um, from ground zero. And um, you, you got to like Josh Heupel and the attitude that he brings and, and the offensive style. And I'm anxious to see the kids and the players. Tennessee's one of those teams to me with a, with a new regime um, starting well on September 2nd against Bowling Green on a Thursday night with, would behoove them to kind of buy into the to the new direction. The worst thing that could happen to these guys is is to get off to a slow start and kind of a roll of the eyes and here we go again kind of thing. They hopefully they start fast and, and, and regain some confidence. Chris Lumpkin in our Facebook comment section says UT is a dumpster fire and when you hear Kirk Herbstreit saying what he's saying there from the sports animal in Knoxville, understanding that he lives in the state of Tennessee, I think Herbstreit's called Nashville home for a number of years, and he knows that he's speaking to Vols fans when he's saying the things that he's saying there. So you get the sense that he's trying to choose his words carefully. He's trying not to, you know, I hate to say it this way, but hurt the feelings of Tennessee fans who just want some hope to to buy into for the upcoming season. And he's left to say, well, if the Vols can just get a win against Bowling Green week one, maybe they can avoid the feeling of, oh, gosh, here we go again, as as he describes there from Tennessee fans. And, you know, I hate to tell you, but that's a pretty bleak outlook on the upcoming season if you're circling Bowling Green in week one to say, hopefully for the Vols we can get a win there to keep this thing from really spiraling out of control after that. Because, you know, week two it's Pitt, which is kind of a winnable game. I mean, Pitt's not a great team. The game's in Knoxville, but obviously that's also a Pitt team that typically plays pretty good defense, runs the football. It's not an easy win for a Tennessee team that's almost the exact opposite of that, right, that wants to throw the ball a bunch and probably not super physical, has nothing to offer defensively right now. It's a matchup that in a lot of ways may favor Pitt in Week 2. Then you kind of get into a stretch with the Tennessee schedule. gets really, really tough. You know, road game Missouri, I think. You got, you know, uh, Kentucky in there. You're talking about obviously Alabama and Georgia, what they bring to the table. There's an Ole Miss game in there too. Of course, Lane Kiffin this week was playing Rocky Top during Ole Miss practice, but uh, you know that's an Ole Miss team that was ranked 25th in the coaches' poll that came out yesterday too. So there's a there's a stretch of schedule, a stretch of games for the for the Vols after those first couple. It's weak opponent week three. You know it's basically Bowling Green Pitt. You know weak opponent 
and then you get into a stretch of SEC games that you don't see an obvious win there. I mean, even South Carolina is the kind of uh, team, you know, given what I think Marshawn Lloyd may do from the running back position, given what I think guys like Zach Pickens and Jordan Birch and possibly Rick Sandage may do along that defensive line. The good defensive line, good running game. I don't even think South Carolina is the kind of win right now that Vols fans can circle on that schedule and say, yeah, this is definitely one we're going to be able to get. This is one that's going to be an easy one for us. I think a Tennessee fan that says that about South Carolina right now is frankly delusional. So when you get into that stretch of SEC games for Tennessee, you get into a pretty challenging landscape pretty quick. So Herb Street, even if he's painting a relatively bleak outlook on all of this, is actually probably correct to say that – yeah, you better get your wins non-conference early when you can because it gets much tougher once you get an SEC play. By the end of the year, you're playing, you know, non-Power 5 opponent again. You're playing Vanderbilt, who I think is going to be the worst team in the SEC. But, man, that stretch of eight or nine games right there in the middle of the season is actually pretty tough for the Vols all the way around. It, it kind of got me thinking. I wanted to go back and look and see what previous Tennessee coaches had done in their first years on the job. And some of these numbers were actually a little better than I thought they were. For instance, Jeremy Pruitt got off to a 3-3 three and three start in his first year in 2018. Included in that was a surprising win against Auburn. Vols pulled an upset that day against Auburn. They do go 5-7 and seven on the year, but 3-3 three and three actually was on a bad start for the first-year coach, Pruitt, there in in that stretch go back to 2013 for a moment butch jones much the same way got off to a four and three start also finished five and seven his first year in 2013 but they actually got off to an okay start there as well at four and three even Derek dooley in a six and seven year in 2010 got off to a two and two start there before kind of going into a little bit of a losing streak so i kind of expected first year tennessee coaches in recent history to get off to a little slower starts than they did i'm not saying that 500 over the course of half a season is necessarily much to shout about but it's actually somewhat better than I thought it would be for Tennessee in this case if they could somehow go three and three in their first six or two and two in their first four I believe most Vols fans would be pretty happy about that because that's not quite what I see the outlook for Tennessee right now I think Tennessee unfortunately is one of the three worst teams in the SEC I think Vanderbilt's dead last in this league and I think Mississippi State and Tennessee are right there in the conversation to who can to see who can be next to the bottom and all of that. This is not a good season for Tennessee, uh, but I think Herb Street's right. You better get your wins where you can. And as other folks from Knoxville have also pointed out, if you can score points, it doesn't matter if you lose. I mean, no one thinks Tennessee's going to win very much this year anyway, but if you can score points, if you can be pretty on offense, you probably buy yourself a little bit of time, a little bit of good grace from your fans to then see if you can get some sort of recruiting process going. But ultimately, in order to be able to do that, you've got to be able to find a quarterback. Speaking of which, before I change the subject off the Tennessee Vols, let me give you a little bit of an update on this just for a moment. Vols quarterback Brian Maurer was not seen at Tennessee practice this week. There was an Instagram post that Maurer put up up that has since been edited to change the language somewhat, but the initial words from Maurer are out there and have been reported by 24-7 Sports and other outlets. What Maurer reportedly said on Instagram was, they took my dream after just four days, that's okay because I'm a soldier. He gives you the hashtag 18 out, assumingly meaning that uh, he's on his way out of the Tennessee program, at least that's a, ray, a way to read into that. And you know, here, here's the thing, and we've seen this at Auburn last year, I think we're seeing this Tennessee right now. You cannot hold a quarterback competition with four guys. You just can't give that many snaps to that many players. You have got to whittle it down a little bit more than that. You know, last year, by the end of spring practice, Gus Malzahn essentially said our quarterback competition is down to Joey Gatewood and it's down to Bo Nix. Or I guess it would be the 2019 season he said that. It's down to Joey Gatewood, it's down to Bo Nix. And, and you know, Malik Willis, Court Sandberg were essentially told they weren't going to be the quarterback. Now, Malik Willis has since transferred to uh, Liberty. <laughs> he may be one of the best players in the country this year so sometimes these decisions aren't exactly brilliant but nonetheless I think Malzahn understood the situation of we can't split up number one reps and practice among four guys we got to whittle this down so yeah you hate that the Brian Maurer era in Tennessee is apparently going to end this way if this is indeed the way that it's going to end but just practically speaking you understand why this is the case if you are, you know, Josh Heupel, you're trying to figure out who you have at quarterback, given the fact that you've got a young, former elite recruit like Harrison Bailey on campus, you've got two pretty big-time transfers, Hendon Hooker and Joe Milton on campus, you've got some fairly substantial names to consider here. Myers occasionally had a nice moment or two there for Tennessee, but you can't give him an equal number of reps. You give the other three guys and ultimately figure out what you have at quarterback. That's just watering down the competition too much with due respect to Maurer on that. So if this is an example of Tennessee kind of 
diminishing the number of quarterbacks who are even vying to be the starting quarterback there. I think ultimately that's probably a you know, semi-good thing for the Vols to do, even if it's bad news for Brian Maurer, who speaks out on Instagram about that. We'll hear from more Vols fans on the show coming up in a moment. Before that, though, here on SEC Country Live, I want to kind of keep our above-the-fold going here there as well and do a little bit more quarterback talk for a moment. But instead of talking Tennessee, let's shift gears and talk Florida for a moment because I've been thinking about this a little bit lately. You know, one of the big stories that exists in the SEC, a common theme that's returned to over and over again, is the idea that Dan Mullen is a quarterback whisperer. That's the phrase you hear, right? It's, it's, it's a it's a not always a well-defined de- de- phrase, but you understand it, that Mullen is thought of as a quarterback whisper, the kind of guy that knows how to get with his quarterbacks, knows how to get the most from those quarterbacks. He's the kind of guy that can build up a quarterback. If anybody in the SEC can, we're told that Dan Mullen can. But let me challenge that narrative just for a moment. And, I, and I'm doing that because I'm thinking about the person of Felipe Franks, who was at Florida and eventually got hurt, lost his starting job, transferred out, went to Arkansas. But let's look for a minute at the last time that Felipe Franks was a full-time starter in 2018 and compare that to what he did last season as a full-time starter for Arkansas in 2020. Now, some of the numbers don't match up perfectly because Arkansas obviously played a lot fewer games in the pandemic year of 2020 than Florida did in the full season of 2018. So I'm not going to compare all the numbers across the board, although I will point out they were very similar in terms of Franks was about four touchdowns for every interception in both of those seasons, 2018 with Florida, 2020 in Arkansas. But look at some of these other numbers there for a moment. That in Florida in 2018, Felipe Franks completed 58.4% of his passes. But last season at Arkansas, he completed 68.5% of his passes. Much better working with Kendall Bryles and the Hogs. At Florida in 2018, he averaged 7.6 yards per attempt. Last season at Arkansas, Felipe Franks averaged 8.9 yards per attempt. Much better every time he dropped back to throw, working with Kendall Browns at Arkansas. And then for passer rating, which I almost didn't mention because the honest truth is I have no idea how passer rating is tabulated, but if we assume for a moment it's a real stat, uh, better at Arkansas once again. His passer rating for Ar- at Arkansas last year was 163.1. It was 143.4 in 2018 with Florida. Now you may say, well, B.A., that's not a fair comparison because he was much more experienced, much older in 2020 than he was in 2018. That might be true. But let's remember how much Florida fans beat up on Felipe Franks when he was uh, Gators quarterback, so much so that Franks once shushed the crowd there. Do you remember that being controversial in 2018 when Franks was so bothered by what Florida fans were saying about him, basically making him the butt of jokes, that when he scored a touchdown, he essentially taunted his own fans because he scored that touchdown? And to kind of add to this conversation a little bit more, Let's also remember here for a moment that Felipe Franks did not get drafted but is in an NFL training camp right now with the Atlanta Falcons. I thought that Tom Pelissero had a very interesting take on this recently in the NFL Network where he talked about Franks turning some heads thus far in Atlanta. Let me read you here a little bit of what Pelissero said on the NFL Network. He says another name to keep in mind, especially as you get into preseason because you're going to see a lot of him, is rookie quarterback Felipe Franks. Huge guy with a huge arm. From what I'm told, he's been following Matt Ryan around the building like a puppy dog soaking up everything that he possibly can. Look for Franks to be one of those guys who jumps out in the preseason. That's Tom Pelissero from the NFL Network saying that he's hearing good things about Felipe Franks. We may see this all with our own eyes come NFL preseason games for the Falcons here very, very soon for those that will be watching those games. Now, here's my point for bringing this up. There are a lot of Florida fans who say, Dan Mullen's great at developing quarterbacks. He didn't develop Felipe Franks because something was wrong with Felipe Franks. But wasn't Franks a better player at Arkansas, better developed at Arkansas than he was uh, at Florida? And apparently Franks, as a quarterback, as a player, isn't so broken that he can't impress people in the early stages of his first NFL training camp to the point they're talking about him on the NFL network. Now, ultimately, what happened with Franks at Florida is water under the bridge. But now we look at Florida transitioning to a new starting quarterback. Kyle Trask is gone. In steps Emory Jones. And you have to wonder, Who is the coach that's going to develop Emory Jones? Is it the Dan Mullen that couldn't get anything out of Felipe Franks? Or is it the Dan Mullen that had success last year when it came to uh, Kyle Trask? I think that's a fair question worth asking. It's also a fair reminder of some of the things that Dan Mullen has said about Emory Jones in the past. Let's go back to the end of spring practice. Now, it is fair to point out that when Mullen talked about Jones' 
at SEC Media Days uh, just a few, you know, a couple of weeks ago. He was pretty complimentary and, and certainly seemed to feel pretty good about what uh, Emory Jones is bringing to the table. But when he was asked if uh, Emory Jones had solidified himself as the surefire, true starting quarterback at the end of spring practice, boy, at that particular time, Mullen didn't really speak with a lot of confidence in relationship to all of that. Let's go back to March as a reminder about Dan Mullen. Take a listen to this. You know what? It's so hard for me because I don't even think in those terms right now, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, you would have to say yes, but I don't, I, I would say, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I'll give you an honest answer. So I would say yes, but I don't think of it in terms like that. Because, you know, I mean, I'm so much in, I mean, you've got to prepare at least two quarterbacks ready to, to, to go. Does that make sense? So, yes. you know, I, my thought process is, okay, we're going to have, I, how are we getting two starters ready? And then we're going to be young after, you know, we have the two young guys. So then we got, then what's the backup plan after we have two starters? Does that kind of make sense? I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'm explaining it the right way, but in my mind, that makes sense. You know what I mean? So it's, it's instead of, hey, Emery's the starter, you're the backup. We need two starters, and then I got to figure out the backup situation beyond that. I mean, if I'm a Florida fan and I'm listening to Dan Mullen say, hey, is what I'm saying making sense? It's making sense to me. Is it making sense to you? we got to have two starters. Well, look, the one thing we've always heard is if you've got two quarterbacks, you actually only have one quarterback. And Dan Mullen saying, hey, this makes sense to me. Does it make sense to you? Maybe I'm not explaining it the right way. Boy, I'm not quite so sure that would instill me, fill me with a lot of confidence. Now, Mullen was more complimentary and seemingly more confident in speaking about Emory Jones at SEC Media Days. But boy, that statement from back at the end of spring practice, to me, still lingers when it comes to the situation with Jones there at Florida. And I think for Mullen this year, you know, Florida comes at number 11 in the coaches poll, but for the most part, no one's really picking them to win the SEC East. And you know, if Mullen wants to stay a part of the relevant conversation in the SEC with LSU trying to bounce back on the t- Florida schedule, by the way, with Texas A&M appearing like it's a program on the rise and obviously whatever Georgia and Alabama and teams like that are going to do, showing that Dan Mullen can be the true quarterback whisperer, to use the same phrase I used earlier, showing that Mullen can truly be the kind of coach that tutors up and gets the best out of a quarterback That's going to be very important to do. With Kyle Trask, no one can deny that's what Mullen did. With Felipe Franks, it's actually turned out that other folks were better at getting talent out of him, getting success out of the talent that Franks possessed, than Mullen himself turned out to be. So I think all of that backstory is very important as we look ahead to Dan Mullen with a brand new starting quarterback here in 2021. Tennessee fans, Florida fans, we'll hear from both of you, all of you, on any other subject there as well. A lot of comments today on both Facebook and YouTube. But before we do any of that here on SEC Country Live, there's also some big news coming out of Alabama. Crimson Tide, number one team in the country, according to the preseason coaches poll, which came out this week, getting 63 of the 65 first place votes. But that doesn't mean that everything is perfect right now in Tuscaloosa either. There was a surprising absence from practice this week with tight end uh, Jaleel Billingsley, one of the up and coming names on the offensive side of the ball in the SEC, and an injury setback for one of the league's most talented defensive players there as well. So I want to get a lot more information on everything that's going on in Alabama right now as the Tide get ready to try to defend as national champions let's do that with our friend ryan fowler from tide 100.9 fm in tuscaloosa hope you enjoy that right now you're on sec country live all right here on sec country live great to welcome in one of the terrific voices talking about the alabama crimson tide ryan fowler from 100.9 fm there in tuscaloosa ryan welcome back to sec country live i know much like the rest of us over there in uh, t-town y'all are looking forward to the start of this college football season Hey, we started at 245, and we're down to 24 days away from Alabama and Miami over in your area. Uh, so we're yeah. excited. Practice underway, and Alabama's uh, really gearing up for a, for a dynamic season. I know we saw the vote yesterday, but uh, a lot of excitement around this program, trying to find a way to repeat as national champs. What do you make of this new-look offense, Bill O'Brien, thus far as offensive coordinator? I know you guys got a chance to hear from him the other day to kick off the season. Obviously, Bryce Young, the presumed starter there at quarterback. New faces, John Mechie, expanded role as wide receiver, kind of taking over the touches that Devontae Smith used to get. What do you make of the way this Alabama offense looks like in the early stages of practice? Well, you know, and that's something that we have been talking about with people that uh, maybe understand the game from a technicality standpoint a lot more than, than I do or maybe your average fan. Uh, I don't know if, if those 
of us that understand that level of football are, is, is really going to be able to notice a difference. I, I think it's going to be very uh, similar to what it was under Sark. Uh, now, Bryce is going to be a little bit different quarterback. I think he may be a little bit more of a Tua-type style of quarterback. I think Mac Jones was, was a little bit different. But I don't know if, if the average person is going to be able to look at Bill O'Brien and say, hey, this is – uh, different than what it is. And I think Nick Saban has made a point of emphasis. Anytime he has changed coordinators, he's always made a made a point to say, "Well, I'm not going to learn what they're going to learn. They're going to learn what we do. We're not going to change a hundred people in the building uh, based on you know what they know. They're going to have to learn our offense." And I think that's what Bill O'Brien kind of confirmed on Sunday. What Nick Saban had said a couple of weeks ago at SEC Media Days. On that offensive side of the ball, there was also some news a few days ago. Jaleel Billingsley, a guy that's been commonly predicted to be among the breakout players in the league this year. Billingsley was away from practice for a while. I guess my understanding is he's now returned, but what's been going on there with the tight end that could have a chance to have a pretty big impact in the Crimson Tide offense this fall? Well, you look at Billingsley, listen, I think when you look at him as an NFL player, I think he's that type of talent. I think he could be a a very big safety outlet uh, for Bryce Young, breaking a new quarterback, breaking new running back, that easy uh, you know, tight end. They always say that uh, many times it's the best friend of a quarterback, and I think it's even more so when you're breaking in a new quarterback. So Billingsley has always had the extreme talent, but I think it's always been lacking in some areas that Nick Saban kind of identified, hey, he needs to become more part of a team and to become more of a team member rather than, uh, you know, not, not being more of isolated to himself. Uh, that he's got to be a leader. He's got to step up. And I think Nick Saban sent that message. And he even said, hey, he'll be out there in a few days. And all of a sudden, it was the next day uh, from that Sunday press conference, and he was back out of practice. So I would just assume, now we talk with Nick Saban later today, or we will in a press conference, and I'm sure there'll be an update. But at this point, you would just have to make the easy assumption and say that Maybe that message was clear because Nick Saban said a few days and it was just a few hours and he was back out on their practice field. Boy, nobody questions the talent of LeBron Ray, one of the big names in the Alabama defense, but unfortunately for that young man, he's just had a hard time staying healthy. The latest example of that, I guess we're calling it a significant groin injury. What is Ray's status here uh, uh, for the upcoming season and how big of a blow is to the Crimson Tide defense right now that he is not 100% healthy? Oh, I think it'd be it would be huge because I think LeBron Ray is a guy that could be a, a super dynamic player. The depth at that position is something that Alabama can work with. They've got some newcomers, but the, really the, the depth is there from the uh, the more experienced guys. A couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, they started three true freshmen. Well, those guys now are going into you know another year. So defensive line is an area. Uh, don't, don't take this the wrong way, but you could afford. Um, if there's one area that you could do, it's probably linebackers and defensive line. Sure. Defensive line, they've got plenty of depth. But LeBron Ray, it's hard to to say that you can uh, have somebody with that type of you know leadership, that type of characteristics. And I've often thought LeBron Ray, if if if, and that word if has been huge for LeBron Ray. It's been all types of injuries that have really kind of dampened his career here at Alabama. But you look at LeBron Ray. Think about a defensive lineman. When Alabama was short at linebacker, that they moved him back to outside backer. That's the type of athlete that LeBron Ray is. If he can stay healthy, he can be primed to have a great season. But that word if has been mighty, mighty huge for LeBron Ray. Ryan, we love talking Alabama football with you. We know that you do that every day right there in Tuscaloosa. Remind folks how they can get you on the radio if they're in the Yellowhammer State or if they're driving around want to dial you up on the Internet. How can they find you there as well? Hey, absolutely. We have a great app. It's a Tide 100.9 app. It's a free download. We do it every day, 2 until 6. Now, we cover the SEC, but nowhere near to the level that you cover the SEC. Uh, we really dial in with probably about 90% Alabama, so those Alabama fans can connect with us on Twitter at Ryan C. Fowler, at Ryan C. Fowler. And, you know, we cover the Alabama uh, Crimson Tide football program 52 weeks out of the year. We'd love to have everybody join us, and uh, we appreciate you guys for being a part of our show. Ryan, hope we can have you back here on SEC Country Live again very soon as well. Hey, thank you, Brandon. Have a great day, man. All right, good stuff there. Ryan Fowler, Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Update on LeBron Ray, what's going on there. Jalil Billingsley, what's going on there. And a lot of changes to the Alabama offense. New coordinator, new quarterback, uh, obviously a new lead receiver with 
Devontae Smith, the Heisman Trophy winner, on his way to the NFL. We'll actually talk more about John Mechie, that Alabama wide receiver. The expectations for him. We'll do more of that later on the show. We'll also get an update on how the Tides national championship hopes stack up in comparison to the rest of the teams ranked in the top five of the preseason coaches poll. That's all coming up in a couple of minutes' time. We welcome in Barry Barger from Bet US. We'll do that in about two minutes. I, I do want to still make room for a lot of your comments there as well. We have not done as much of that on the show yet as I like to do. But uh, the Alabama stuff is on the table. We talked the dire outlook for Tennessee off the very top of the program. My take on Dan Mullen there a moment ago there as well. So let's dive in here, get a few comments. We'll talk to Barry Barger after that. Uh, Epic Robinson checking in. He's (laughs) saying that he thinks that Tennessee is a a dumpster fire. and He's got uh, Tennessee fans mad at him. That's par for the course here in our comment section. Will Jack says that Alabama was never short of linebackers. So he's uh, feeling pretty good about that Alabama uh, defense right now. Uh, Kevin Zeminski gives you a uh, shout-out to the uh, Gator Nation, giving you a chomp-chomp there on that. Uh, Shane Allen says that uh, I forgot that Felipe Franks only started in two games in 2019. It's important to note, though, and I feel like I made this pretty clear, that we were comparing what Franks did in 2020 when he started every game, I believe, but one, am I right about that, for Arkansas in 2020, to his last full season as a starter, which was 2018. And Florida fans can say what they want about that partial season in 2019, but there weren't a lot of uh, Gators fans, you know, lamenting the status of Franks there at the time. I mean, unfortunately, Florida fans did not cover themselves in glory in terms of the way that they kind of responded to Felipe Franks the entire time he was in Gainesville. Uh, Drew Penn says if anyone can get the most of a quarterback, it's Dan Mullen. He's proven it his entire career. Frank still won 10 games as a starter under Dan Mullen. Once again, and I appreciate Drew's opinion, but it sort of feels a little bit of revisionist history to say that Florida fans were loving what Dan Mullen was supposedly getting out of Felipe Franks going back to that time. He was not a popular player. His own behavior towards Florida fans is an indication of that. Plus, uh, Franks got booed heartily when he returned uh, – from for Arkansas a year ago. So some of that is a little bit of a revisionist history all the way around. Uh, Bruce Eklund says, and then Bruce is a Georgia fan, uh, he says that Dan Mullen qualifies the things that he says with, quote, to be honest. Why not always just be honest? Why the need to qualify the statement? Uh, Deontay Ju- uh, Julian checking in. Deontay's also a Florida fan saying, like I always say, it's the Gators quarterback situation that hits us every year. Trask was our best option since Tim Tebow. And I think that's an interesting point. And, you know, obviously go back to like the Will Muschamp era. That was something that Florida never could really figure out. The Jim McElwain era, that was kind of a similar situation there. And the one thing that no one's going to deny is that uh, clearly Dan Mullen got a lot out of Kyle Trask. Trask a year ago clearly had a very effective season. And what Florida did with the quarterback play was – a big reason why they won the SEC East, they gave Alabama a real challenge in the SEC championship game. No one can deny that, but I think when you look at what has happened at Florida beyond just what's gone on with Kyle Trask, I think it's far from a given that they'll find that same level of success with Emory Jones here this year. They very well might. Jones was an elite prospect coming out of high school, had big programs like Alabama and Ohio State as a part of that recruitment. Florida ultimately won that, but just where does – uh, Emory Jones belong in the conversation of league quarterbacks in the SEC. All of that is still yet to be determined. We'll have a lot more of your comments on the show here today on SEC Country Live. But for now, as promised, a little bit of a deeper look at those teams ranked at the top of the coaches poll for the preseason, which came out uh, just this week. And who's got the best shot from that group to win the national championship, according to the odds that you can find there at BetUS. And speaking of BetUS, our good buddy Barry Barger from BetUS joins us here on SEC Country Live right now. Barry, welcome in. Thanks for being here. And certainly looking forward to talking a little gambling with you as our chances to watch some of these football teams we're talking about the preseason, a chance to see them on the football field is coming up certainly very soon. Oh my God, it's great, isn't it? A little it is different great. than last year. Oh yeah, it's no doubt. It's gonna be great with the fans back, huh? <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Much, much better conversation all the way around. And of course, Bet US right at the center of all of that. They've been America's favorite sports book going like 25 years now when it comes to taking good care of their players. Also, great, great incentive for you there as well right now. Let me give a shout out to this. Let's throw this on the screen and show folks what Bet US is doing for folks right now. When you go to betus.com, when you use the promo code SEC125, you're going to receive 125% of your bonus on your initial deposit 
deposit. That's a great, great way to get things started with BetUS here for the upcoming season. Bear with that in mind. I want to show folks on the screen here some odds they can get at BetUS right now. Looking ahead, futures odds on winning this year's national championship. And I want to specifically highlight the top five teams in the preseason coaches poll, which came out earlier this week. Obviously, Alabama's number one. They are plus 250, an incredibly low number to win the national championship. That's how big of a favorite they are right now. Clemson, not much different. They're at plus 350. You've got Oklahoma, the number three team, at plus 750, which is about 7.5 to 1 for folks who are not you know quite as familiar with that. Ohio State's at uh, plus 600 or 6 to 1. Georgia, the number five team, actually has better odds than two of the teams rated a- a- ahead of it. Uh, Georgia's at five to one right now or plus 500 barry if i give you those bama at plus 250 clemson at plus 350 oklahoma at plus 750 ohio state at six to one georgia five to one the only teams by the way in the country that are less than 10 to one to win the national championship for the upcoming season where do you see a best bet from that group right now oh my god i'm all over georgia this year you gotta be kidding me they're returning 20 of their starters um, they've got a great defense. I mean, JT Daniels. Oh, there's also Heisman odds. JT Daniels is, I think, the fourth favorite at nine to one. You know, to win the Heisman this year. Obviously, Rattler, Spencer Rattler from Oklahoma is a favorite at four to one. But Georgia's got. I mean, they've got everything there, and this is the year at, to take advantage of Alabama and get them. I mean, they're losing seven starters on offense. Uh, you know, they're going to have to be a defensive team. They got, you know. Alabama's got a new quarterback, Bryce Young, and and, and Georgia. With with, I just it's just everything points to them, and you can see the odds going. You know they're five to one. They're they're ranked number five. They're the third favorite. You know they're they're already climbing up the board, and I think that uh, I think Clemson loses hmm. that first game. Wow! Truthfully, man. I mean, that's, it's crazy, but, like, in the last – and Georgia's been – they've been solid as heck forever. In the last few years, they've landed more five-star recruits than anybody. Um, it, you know, even Alabama. Even though Alabama had the best recruiting class again last year, you know, it seems like every every year. But, sure. uh, but Georgia's landed all those five-stars, and they – and, and man, this is the year for them. I'm telling. I, I just I I looked at this, looked, at, and it's just the opportunities there in Alabama. It's 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 just they've got an opening. I'm really kind of psyched that the five to one. That's got to go down to like three, I would guess. So, so I, I want to ask. Time season starts. I want to ask you this because you mentioned the Heisman odds there as well. When you see a team like Ohio State right now that's at six to one, you mentioned Heisman odds. Part of me wonders, given the number of like Heisman quarterbacks that also win national champions, that if I like a team like Ohio State at six to one, or a team like as you said Georgia at five to one, which also has better odds than that, a longer shot on a guy like JT Daniels win the Heisman Trophy. If it isn't more fun, slightly better payout if you win, not to worry about the national championship bet or to kind of make your national championship bet on the quarterback to win the Heisman, knowing how frequently those two things have been coupled. So whether it's Daniels at, I think you said, 9-1, to one, or C.J. Stroud from Ohio State, which at last check I believe at BetUS is around 14-1 to 15, one or something like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, you almost, now, yeah. Yeah, you almost wonder if, if, um, if the Heisman quarterback bet isn't a better way to get better odds on the team that you think might win the national championship. Great theory. That's a great theory. I never, I've never thought of it that way. But you are, you're getting better odds on all those players. Okay, so last year was the first in I don't know, I don't know how many years, at least five that uh, the Heisman did not go to a quarterback. Yeah, and so, so when you're doing that, I mean, that's a that's really kind of a great theory. And if you really want to go all in, I mean, bet them both. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <That's a> Heisman. <laughs> They won't let you parlay those because that'll be correlated, and uh, you know you're taking advantage. <laughs> you're getting a double bubble a little bit on that baby, but but you know, I mean, if what if what if they win like last year? So Bama wins, and um, you know, I mean, you at least hit one. Sure, <laughs> no on, doubt. On the quarterback, you know, if you bet quarterbacks and the, and the team, but uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's a great theory, and. Um, Ohio State, no, just you know, a lot of these teams. So Clemson loses Lawrence, Bama loses their 
Ohio State loses Justin Fields, guess what? Georgia, JT Daniels. Um, I I looked at this cut and I'm like, why are they why are they ranked five? I just you know I think it's going more by pass. They're not yeah. going by this year because to be returning twenty starters, um, and of course Bama's going to be ranked number one always um, because of their recruiting classes and they've got a guy standing in behind their quarterback and running back that's just as good as anybody in the nation always. But Georgia's gelling. This is, a, a, you know, their, t- their win total this year is 11, and if you bet over those wins, it's minus 120. So yeah. it's 120 to 100 if you bet over 11. Uh, that's another good one. I, I just see that Georgia, across the board, are a bunch of good bets. I, I think this is the, the year for Kirby Smart. Well, it's, really do. it's a fun conversation to have. And, of course, when you think about Bet US, it's not just the college football action you can get your bets down on. All across the sporting landscape, Bet US got great odds on all of those. And, as we said before, a great, great deal when you get ready to sign up for the very first time. If you go to BetUS.com, use the promo code SEC125, you're going to get 125% bonus on your initial deposit. That's a great way to really be a winner before you even make your first bet. That's what they're giving you at Bet US. They've been doing this for for more than 25 years. They are so much fun to uh, do business with because they love taking care of their players. That's why we love having them here on SEC Country Live. Barry, we love having you here on the show there as well. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Fantastic. Thanks. Enjoy the time. Go Georgia. Good stuff there from uh, Barry Barger from Bet US, weighing in heavy on the Georgia Bulldogs. He likes them at five to one right now, plus five hundred to win the SEC. I should say the national championship. So good stuff all the way around there. All right, let's do this. Let me take a couple more of your comments, and then we got to get back in. I got more. I got a lot more news we've got to do before the show is done. So I'm going to try to get as much as I can here, and we'll see if we can uh, kind of keep the show on the tracks here. Brent Crossland checking in to say Gigum from Vegas. So a uh, big Aggies fan checking in from Las Vegas. Brent, glad to have you as part of the program here today. And, you know, I think the Texas A&M right now sits as a pretty interesting team in the SEC. They are sixth in the coaches poll, just below Georgia at five. A&M is a team that I'm not ready to pick them to win the SEC West as of yet. But could this be a team that goes 11-1 and one and being very much in a similar position to what they were a year ago as a non-SEC champion who has a strong case to potentially be a second team from the league into the college football playoff? Yeah, I think A&M has a very good chance of being a part of that conversation. And you just heard Barry Barger give you a lot of love for the Georgia Bulldogs a moment ago. I think it could be very interesting to see how a Georgia A&M comparison could eventually look with both those teams trying to make their case, if we presume for a moment the favorite Alabama wins the SEC, how a Georgia and a Texas A&M could look as a argument side-by-side comparison for a second SEC team into the college football playoff. That could actually get pretty interesting when it's all said and done. David Austin also checking in to give you a little bit of a gigum. He's checking in from Fort Worth here. Chris Kelly with a little go Vols here. So a lot of SEC fans uh, representing the comment section here today, and that's always a fun thing to see. David asking if A&M plays Georgia this year. Not a regular season game. They could play in the SEC championship. Obviously, they're among the the favorites to get to Atlanta, although Alabama admittedly is the odds-on favorite there in the SEC West. But as I said before, even without playing in the regular season, you could see Georgia and Texas A&M commonly linked in a conversation to be playoff contenders as a potential second representative from this conference. The other thing that Georgia and Texas A&M are going to be very closely linked on is very interesting commonalities in some of their recruiting battles. Georgia trying to go into Texas for a guy like Bear Alexander, a big five-star defensive lineman. Texas A&M trying to come into Georgia for a guy like the five-star defensive back, Deion Bowie. At one point in time, they were battling over Kojo Antwi, a four-star wide receiver who ended up committing to Ohio State. So you've also seen some cross-pollination of Georgia and Texas A&M when it comes to some of their recruiting stuff here so far uh, this year there as well. Over here on YouTube for a moment, Jay Scheib says that A&M better worry about Arkansas. Jay's been down on on Texas A&M, and he kind of keeps that going with his comment there on YouTube. Uh, G. Grace Bama Boy also on YouTube says that Bama doesn't care what y'all think. So uh, G. Grace uh, feeling pretty confident about his team here for the upcoming season. Uh, he's He's feeling pretty good about that all the way around. 
Johnny Lester checking in on the program today. Mark Morris has a prediction of dogs versus Bam in the SEC championship. He says if both are undefeated going to the game, both are going to the playoffs. And, Mark, it's an interesting point. It's one of the reasons why I think for Georgia, and we're going to talk more Georgia here in a moment, but it's one of the reasons why I think for Georgia that week one game against Clemson is just so important because the one thing that Georgia's had its issues with is getting over the hump in that SEC championship game. Did it in 2017, but came close against Alabama with no cigar in 2018, and obviously got beaten up pretty good by LSU in 2019. If you're a Georgia fan, knowing that the SEC championship game has been a tough ticket to punch as far as a springboard of the college football playoff, to think that it, you're, if you're Georgia, you could build a playoff resume before you get to that SEC championship game, that'd be quite a luxury for UGA in a game like Clemson, although it's tough to win, but the fact that it is tough to win makes it a potential showcase if you do win. I think you're making a pretty good point. Let's see what else is going on in the YouTube comment section for right now. Johnny Lester says that Bama's got to replace their all-time most productive quarterback, best all-around running back, uh, two first-round wide receivers, maybe one of their best left tackles, definitely their best OC ever. Good luck. And I think that Johnny's not completely unfair by saying that. Obviously, Alabama fans are going to you know, suggest that Alabama's going to easily dust all that off and be just fine. But of all the names that Johnny mentions that are difficult for Alabama to replace, I'll say now what I've said before. The toughest of them all is Steve Sarkeesian. Alabama has had a number of good offensive coordinators in recent seasons, starting with Lane Kiffin in 2014, Brian Dable after that, who's gone on to be one of the top play callers in the NFL with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, obviously, Michael Oxley was a very good offensive coordinator after that, and then Sarkeesian takes over in the wake of all of that. But for as good as the previous guys had been under Nick Saban, I think that Sarkeesian last year proved to be the best of them all, averaging nearly 50 points a game, getting far more out of Mac Jones than any Alabama fan would have ever thought was a possibility there. This was an uncommon level of success that Sarkeesian produced for Alabama. He helped make Devontae Smith into a Heisman Trophy winner. He helped make Mac Jones and Najee Harris into first-round picks. And Bill O'Brien, even though that he has a pretty sterling resume, head coach of the NFL, former head coach at Penn State, a guy who's been around the play-calling business for a long time, Bill O'Brien doing what Steve Sarkeesian did last year will not be an easy thing to replicate. It just won't. A few more comments here on Facebook. Then we're going to dive into some of the rest of the news. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Some folks talking about uh, Alex McGee on the subject of uh, Bam and UG in the SEC championship game being the best game of the season. Yeah, Alex, I mean, obviously, you know, for both sides, that could be quite a collision course, right? You know, they, they're, they're programs that have some backstory now. They've played a few times under Kirby Smart. Obviously, Kirby and Jimbo Fisher and Lane Kiffin, a lot of these coaches in the SEC, all working to become the first former, former Saban assistant to get that head-to-head -head win against the old boss there. And obviously, the SEC championship game, presuming someone doesn't do that sooner, uh, could be a big one there for, uh, for Georgia and Alabama, to be sure. Uh, great comments rolling in here right now. Penny actually checking in to give you a whoa pick suey. Go Hogs. Uh, Penny feeling pretty good about Arkansas here for this upcoming season. Uh, that's good stuff all the way around there on that. Uh, David Austin also mentioned that Georgia and Texas A&M are both recruiting each other's states a lot lately. Yeah, Georgia's had some really good Texans on the uh, roster, and then obviously Texas A&M under Jimbo Fisher is really increasing its national footprint in recruiting. You do see a lot of that going on right now. Okay, we'll get back to more of your comments in a moment, but i, I got to make sure we keep the news going here a little bit there as well. Let's do our uh, all-points bulletin. Let's check in on some of the other spots around the SEC and get some news. And since we're on Georgia in our comments, let's stay on Georgia right here there as well. I thought it was interesting if we head over to Athens, Georgia for a moment that SEC Network analyst Cole Kubelik has tabbed his breakout players for the upcoming season. And the number one name he had on his list was a guy that wasn't really even a starter a year ago. That's Kendall Milton, the running back from Georgia. Ahead of Mookie Cooper, the Missouri wide receiver. And by the way, let's just all stop and pause on what a great name Mookie Cooper is. That's a terrific, terrific name. Uh, Cole Taylor, the LSU tight end, also coming up here. EJ Jenkins, the South Carolina wide receiver, and Javarius Johnson, the Auburn wide receiver. So some interesting names among the breakout potential there in the SEC. But it's Georgia running back Kendall Milton that comes number one on this list. Milton was a former, you know, pretty top-rated recruit. Rivals had him as a five-star. 24-7 uh, had him as a four-star. I think in the composite, he was the number seven running back in the country for the class of 2020. And he's a guy that really had some chances to do some big things a year ago. In fact, someone who covers Milton on a regular basis for my day job, dognation.com, the other website that I work for, 
uh, Mike Griffith joined me on my morning show, Dog Nation Daily here today, and talked about how some of the buzz that seems to exist around Milton right now actually could have come to pass a year ago. This is Mike Griffith on that topic. Take a listen to this. Remember, Milton had the hamstring at the beginning of the year. And then just when he got rolling, he, he sprained the knee against Florida. He could have been a difference maker in that Florida game with more carries for all we know. Uh, this is a dynamic running back that we're talking about, a game changer, a type of game changing running back. Milton really suffered because they didn't have the spring that I expect to have big years for Georgia. So what's interesting here, whether it's Milton or the guys right now, upperclassmen that are kind of seemingly thought to be ahead, of Milton in the depth chart, guys like James Cook, the brother of Dalvin Cook, who's obviously in the NFL with the Minnesota Vikings, or Zamir White, who's the former number one running back from the class of 2018. One way or another, if you're a Georgia fan, I think the thing that you're saying is, even in a year when Georgia is thought to be looking to throw the ball more with Todd Munkin in his year two of offensive coordinator and with JT Daniels as starting quarterback, even with those things being true, this is a Georgia team that I think Georgia fans would say needs to get back to running the football the way that it once did. Last year, 2020, was a little bit of a departure in that regard. And really, 2019, the final year of DeAndre Swift, at least in terms of the overall statistical output, was not the same thing that the Georgia running game had been in 2017 and 2018 when you had great tandems of running backs. Think about Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle in 2017, Elijah Holyfield and Swift in 2018. 2019 2020 the last two seasons georgia just probably hasn't quite been as explosive in the running game some of that probably due to the fact that opposing defenses simply just knew what was coming before the ball was even snapped they knew georgia was likely to run the football and they were just ready to stop that with a more potent passing attack maybe no matter who's toting the rock for georgia it's just less likely that opposing defenses can be ready for it because of the fact that uh, Georgia may do some things offensively that keeps opposing defenses guessing. But it's interesting to hear Cole Kublik rank Milton as high as he does in terms of his breakout potential for Georgia fans. They certainly hope that's true. But also on the rest of that list there, for teams that need help at wideout, like Auburn, like South Carolina, to see Cole Kublik identify those players there as well makes for the kind of season where we could see some interesting names emerging here and interesting to see Kublik from the SEC Network weighing on that. On that. We mentioned Javaris Johnson, the Auburn wide receiver. Speaking of the Tigers, let's keep the uh, conversation going here for a moment with actually some bad news coming out of Auburn. We started the show by talking about what I think of as a relatively bleak outlook for Tennessee and its first-year coach, Josh Heupel. Also a little bit of a setback right now for Auburn when it comes to Tyrone Truesdale, Two-year starter for the Tigers on the defensive line. This is a big nose guy, nose man, occupies a lot of space there in the interior of that Auburn defense. But it was reported earlier this week that Truesdale had not been seen at Auburn practice. In fact, here he is uh, being reported by rivals, their transfer portal Twitter account, that he's entered the transfer portal as a grad transfer after totaling 67 tackles, three sacks at Auburn, starter over the course of the last couple of seasons. As the tweet mentions, this is a little bit of a weird scenario in the fact that Truesdale had just graduated from Auburn. No one around the Auburn program at all is saying really a bad word about him whatsoever. This is not the kind of guy that um, ran afoul of the new coaching staff. At least that's the, the sense here. This is not the kind of guy that was kicked off the team, just to be blunt about this. That's not the kind of person Truesdale is by almost every, everybody's estimation here. And he's the kind of guy who had played a lot of football for the previous coaching staff there. So what did happen and why is a multi-year starter for Auburn who now has graduated from the university, why is he no longer on the football team? Well, you know, Auburn coach Brian Harson was asked about this earlier this week, and he did his part to at least shed some light on this. This is what Harson said when the subject of Truesdale came up during a press conference just within the last 24 hours. Here's Brian Harson. Brian, we haven't seen Tyrone Truesdale the last few practices. Do you just have any updates on his status? Yeah, as of right now, he is not a part of this football team. And that's where we stand at this point. And, you know, the guys that are in camp, Obviously, since we've been here over the last eight months, you know, there's been guys that were here and there's guys that aren't for various reasons. You know, that's part of being on a team. There's more things, and not so much in, in his his case, but just overall in general. I mean, being a part of a team, there's there's a lot of little things that, that we all have to do each and every day. And the guys that are in camp right now, you know, they've worked really hard to be there. And, you know, hopefully that continues and, and we we keep focused on the things that we need to do not just on the field, but overall in this program. And 
that continues to be part of our culture and, and the environment that we have each and every day. Mark Morris in our YouTube comment section asked a really good question. He says, I thought you couldn't transfer at the July 1st deadline. That is true if you want to play at the FBS Power 5 level, that Truesdale could drop down a level, I believe. Y'all, I guess y'all check me on this. But I believe that deadline for notifying of transferring only it works or matters if you're transferring to another Power 5 level school. But if you're dropping down to the FCS level, he could be immediately eligible. It's one of the things I think, Mark, that makes this pretty weird. And I'm not saying weird in the fact that something nefarious has gone on or anything like that, but this is not the kind of player that you expect to lose, at least I would think, this late in the process. The best that I can tell, no one really has much of an idea of what's going on with this at all, or at least the last time I checked on this, no one seemed to have much of an idea on this. So it certainly seems like Truesdale's immediate plans are not to go and play somewhere else right away because, as you said, my understanding of the current deadline would prohibit that from happening this year. And given the fact that he's a, you know, graduate, you know, transfer type player, you know, you start to think about his future eligibility there as well. That this would seem to be a scenario where, at least my understanding of the rules, and gosh knows I get this kind of stuff wrong all the time, I guess. But my understanding of the rules is that if Truesdale wants to play again, he'd have to go down to the level below to be able to do that. So. Don't really know what his football future holds, but for Auburn in a what was already going to be a challenging year for first year coach Brian Harson and his first year defensive coordinator, former Vanderbilt head coach Derek Mason, the absence of a veteran presence like Truesdale, who universally seems to be believed to have been a positive impact on that locker room, this would not seem to be good news for Auburn, but it is the news that program is dealing with right now, nonetheless. Auburn sits up with a season win total of about six and a half at Bet US. Uh, this is a team that has early season road games at LSU, at Penn State, big non-conference game there for the Tigers up there in Happy Valley, a big early October date hosting Georgia, obviously a lot of energy around that game every single year. Of course, last year was supposed to be the first year of this series being moved to October after the thing had been played in November for what seems like 100 years, and I guess probably was you know 100 plus years, now a part of the October calendar for both these teams. And for Auburn, you're going to think one of two things is true. Either they're getting some big wins against teams like LSU or Penn State early in the season, and the atmosphere is very intense for that big home game against Georgia, or if those road games go the wrong direction for the Tigers, all of a sudden that chance to fill Jordan-Hare Stadium and create some energy and and feel like you got that big game on the plains, that might slip away depending on what Auburn does in a couple of those really tough September contests there. So pay attention to that. Let's move on here on SEC Country Live. I mentioned a moment ago Cole Kublik announcing some of his breakout players. Matt Stinchcomb, another SEC network analyst, was on SEC Now this week. He was also talking about his top wide receivers in the SEC this year. And I'm going to give some credit to Matt for kind of going – you know, beyond the obvious names here for a little bit, Keishon Butte from LSU comes at number four on that list. John Mechie the third from Alabama comes at number three. But look at number one on the top of this list, Traylon Burks, the uh, Arkansas wide receiver, and Anaya Smith, the Texas A&M wide receiver. Let me give you a couple of things about the other names. I want to focus on John Mechie after that for a moment. Obviously for Anaya Smith, I think for Texas A&M, we've had a lot of Aggies fans checking in the comments section today. One of the reasons why I was hesitant about the likelihood that Texas A&M could truly compete for the SEC West this year, a lot of that is just simply on the basis of you love the running game, even with the need to replace the starters along the offensive line. I still like Texas A&M on both lines of scrimmage. I believe that Mike Elko is just simply one of the best defensive coordinators in college football, and so you feel pretty good about the Aggies on that side of the ball. Really under Jimbo Fisher, Texas A&M has just become a more physical team really on both sides of the ball, and you got to give Jimbo some credit for doing that. But the one thing that I don't see, even though I believe that Hayes King, who I presume is going to become the starting quarterback at Texas A&M, even though I think of him as a pretty good quarterback prospect all the way around, the one thing I really don't see for Texas A&M right now is that very impressive wide receiver, that obvious game-breaking guy on the outside. But Stinchcomb tells you to watch Smith closely there, and I will indeed be doing that because – if I'm the, the belief that A&M has a chance to be 11-1, and one, but not really that chance to beat Alabama, if Smith has the kind of year at wide receiver that Matt Stinchcomb suggests as a possibility, boy, that could really potentially change that conversation. So that is clearly worth paying attention to when it comes to that. But to only see John Mechie third on this list, I find that to be pretty interesting because 
what I saw from Mechie a year ago was another one of these Alabama guys, and, and Mechie was not like composite five star, you know, best recruit in the country. You know, he's an Alabama caliber recruit, but this isn't, and Alabama said a few of these lately. You know, this is not a guy that was an obvious five star and can't miss prospect. This is just a guy that's come into the Alabama program and proven himself to be a very, very capable player. And the kinds of ways in which Devontae Smith was targeted throughout all of last year and the ways in which Jalen Waddle was targeted before his injury, I mean, you really get the sense that John Mechie's going to slip into that role here. And, you know, maybe it's a Jai Hall there as well, the, I think, good-looking freshman wide receiver who's probably going to get a chance to really do some things. But you got to wonder – is there a regret at some point in time that you had a chance to rank the SEC wide receivers at the beginning of the season and you didn't rank John Mechie number one overall? Mechie is the kind of guy that has the talent to maybe make you regret that by the time the season's done. I would say that Butte from LSU is in that discussion there as well, but interesting to see two receivers rated right ahead of them, especially given the fact that Mechie is going to be the focal point so much for that Alabama offense here this season. All right, we're going to close things out in just a moment with our SEC LOL. I've got kind of a funny way to finish things off today. We'll do that coming up in a moment. But let me get a little bit more um, comments in very quickly before we get ready to wrap things up. Jerome from Birmingham checking in today. Always love to see Jerome in there. John Freeman checking in. Good to see you too, John. Glad you're here. Uh, Jay Shipes on the subject of John Mechie saying he'd be higher ranked if he got hit in stride this year instead of backtracking. <laughs> this is A-plus trolling right here. Jay says, Jay says that Mechie's going to be ranked higher if he got hit in stride more instead of having to backtrack due to bailout Bryce. <laughs> that, is a, that is an A-plus trolling tweet from Jay Shipes right there suggesting that Bryce Young is not going to be able to hit him in stride. Um, uh, Jerry Popham uh, jumping in here to say, I ask you again, B.A., to not do what you did this morning. That would be to give any uh, degree of credibility. Um, uh, so I guess uh, Jerry Popham's upset with me about something. Uh, I'm not really quite sure what I did. But uh, Kevin Zeminski checking in. Thanks for the kind words. I, so Jerry Popham's upset about something. I apologize, Jerry, if I if I did the wrong thing. Jared Bogarty says, uh, "R.I.P. Bobby Bowden. Going to miss you, Coach." Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously that's one been one of the stories that's dominated the week there as well. The the uh, the respect being paid to really one of the college football legends and one of the guys that you know I have so much esteem for for what he did on the field. Not an SEC guy, but he had more ties to the SEC than you might realize. Growing up in Birmingham briefly an Alabama player, leaving Alabama because Alabama at the time did not allow players to be married. He went on to the school that would later be known as Samford so that he could marry his high school sweetheart. They stayed married for the entirety of their lives, uh, obviously almost took the Alabama job. Some of y'all know better than me. Is that before Ray Perkins took it? Is that when uh, – or is it after Ray Perkins left? Some of y'all know that better than me. I apologize. I'm a little bit young to really remember that. But there was some talk that – uh, Bowden might take the Alabama job, ultimately did not do that. And just even though that most of his career took place outside the SEC, obviously a gigantic figure in the world of college football, for sure, for sure, all the way around. All right. Mike uh, Kalazeski, uh, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, says ESPN simulation of Florida, Georgia this year has the Gators winning 30-27. Boy, I'd check the coding on that computer if that would be the case, Mike. I believe I might check that uh, coding on that. Let's see what else. Um, Mary August says that Kirk Herbstreit, who we started the show by talking about, says he's never said anything good about Tennessee Vols ever, so Mary's no big fan of Kirk Herbstreit there on that front. David Austin also asking how well A&M would fare if Kellen Mond uh, is gone. As said before, I think Hayes King, who's likely to emerge as the Texas A&M starting quarterback, I actually think he's a pretty good prospect. It would not surprise me to see him do some pretty big things this year. Also, we talked earlier about you know what uh, Dan Mullen is as a quarterback whisperer. I mean, I think one of the guys that really has some of that credential more so than sometimes SEC fans give him credit for is Jimbo Fisher. Look at all the quarterbacks as an offensive coordinator, then as a head coach. Look at all of the 
uh, quarterbacks that that Jimbo Fisher has put in the first round of the NFL draft. That's something I think that matters in this discussion. All right, we'd like to finish things up with what we call our SEC LOL, just kind of a lighthearted way to close out the day. And this one not necessarily SEC related, although I saw plenty of SEC fans having fun with it. So let me see if I can set the, the backstory here. So this is a fake tweet, but there's a confluence of events that certainly made it not seem fake including the fact the tweet overall is just really well done. Normally, I don't like these fake Twitter accounts because I just think they're a total waste of time. But honestly, this one I got to give a little credit for. Let me show you this in the screen. So this is CFB Home, a notorious troll account that has fake stuff all the time. And so what CFB Home tweets out is, is that Nebraska is going to unveil their, quote, little red alternate uniforms versus Oklahoma in September. Uh, they say hashtag Huskers, hashtag go big red. So what you see here in the background is the little red uh, Nebraska mascot and the red suspenders overalls, I guess you call those, the red overalls, that the Nebraska uniform is supposedly going to be the red, little red overall outfit. And all of college football was kind of blowing up about this. The reasons why a lot of people thought this was real was, A, the graphic here is incredibly well done. So I don't know who made this graphic, but, man, that thing looks like it could be real, right? I mean, that just looks like it could be real. Uh, the other thing is Nebraska recently did do an alternate uniform reveal, but they wouldn't allow any photos to be taken of the alternate uniform. So there was already a little bit of curiosity about the Nebraska uniforms were going to be. And so this you know fake troll Twitter account slides in here and gives you what I think are pretty funny, you know, red overall type uniforms. The other part about this is it's not like these are the ugliest uniforms that have ever been worn in college football. They're not worse than those Swamp Thing things that Florida wore a couple of years ago for sure. It's also, I think, fair to point out this is not the first time that CFB Home has essentially done the same joke. They did this a couple of years ago with Texas A&M and those 12th man, like, denim overall things that their fans like to wear, and they kind of did something like that for the Texas A&M uniform there too. So this is a fake tweet. A lot of folks thought it wasn't. And I guess in a way I'm kind of glad it is fake because I'm already not all that happy with how a lot of the uniform stuff in college football is trending. And I think this would have been another step in the wrong direction if that was indeed the case. Either way, we appreciate you being here for SEC Country Live. Thanks so much for your support of what we do here. Remind folks, Facebook and YouTube, we're doing the show each and every Wednesday live at 3 p.m. Eastern time. It's a great privilege to be able to bring it to you. Look forward to doing it again next Wednesday. We're getting closer and closer to that season. So stop back by. We'll talk some SEC. We'll trash talk. We'll debate. We'll do it all. But we will share in our appreciation and love for the SEC and the sport of college football. Can't wait for more next week. Thanks for being here for SEC Country Live.